Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And as, as Alex mentioned, I gave a talk here three and a half years ago. Was anyone at that talk who's here today? All right. At that talk, I realized I jumped in right in the middle, and I think I lost everybody. So this is my chance at redemption. Um, so this talk is going to be mostly tutorial on latent variable models for time series. And then at the end, we'll have laid the groundwork for me talking about neural ODEs and then neural stochastic differential equations, which is something that is just very hot off the presses. We just submitted to AI stats, just barely works. But I'm very excited to be presenting it here because the, these models were inspired by the sort of horrible, messy biological data that you guys actually deal with. And already I met with uh, Ang Kui, who presented her problem that has exactly the flavor that these models are trying to um, address. Okay. So, as I think all of you guys know, and the reason I'm here is because irregularly sampled data sets are kind of the norm. And the reason that I got into all of this was dealing with data sets that took tumor assays from patients at different times throughout the year. And we wanted to build some model of tumor evolution. Um, and when I say irregularly sampled time series, there's another axis along which data can be, or time series can be irregular, not just when it's observed, but also which variables are observed. Oops, can you guys see my pointer up there? Oh no, invisible pointer, hmm. Okay, well, as you guys can see up there, here's the PhysioNet data set of patients in an ICU for 48 hours. And people, you know, the doctors dutifully measured or noted when every measurement was made, but not every, every measurement was made at, the, at every measurement time. Okay, the other thing I wanna keep in your mind is, as I'm sure any of you who have tried to build these models understand, we can't just use Gaussian like it's for everything. We might have all sorts of crazy data such as even like text annotations. And we want the state of our model to be able to tell us something about, you know, what would we expect the doctor to write on this chart? Okay. Um, and now, of course, you guys have just lived through the latest deep learning hype cycle, um, and I'm sure it's still sort of like burning through your areas. But I'm sure that you've all noticed that all the sort of best large parametric deep models really are designed for discrete time data, like video or sound. And um, in particular, I mean recurrent neural networks or all their various flavors like LSTMs and WaveNet, whatever. Um, even old standards like hidden Markov models. Um, and even the, one of my favorite model classes, deep Markov models. And I'm really happy. I just noticed David Sontag just sat down. Um, you know, these, these are all very powerful model classes, but fundamentally it's a little bit awkward to apply them to this sort of irregularly sampled data. So, of course, what we really end up doing is just project, or rather what people do is they bin the data. So I guess, just to be clear what I meant here, um, is that if we have such irregularly sampled data, we just you know, choose every day or every hour, we're going to take all the data in that bin and turn it into some you know, summary statistics like averaging all the data within that each bin. And then boom, we can apply an RNN to this binned data. And of course this is terrible. Um, so one thing that, you know, one problem that comes up is sometimes there just isn't any data in a bin in which case you have to impute the data, which is, seems so perverse to me, A, because you have to solve the original problem that you're trying to uh, you know, build a model for in the first place, which is what should the data look like if I didn't see it, right? You have to make a prediction about data you didn't see. That's what the model is for. So you have to build a little crappy mini model to get started. And the other problem is now if I start you know, filling in the blanks everywhere, my uncertainty estimates are messed up because it's no longer clear to my later on model which data was original and which data is just like, you know, a nice guess that might help you. Um, I think in the future there should be some sort of Hippocratic oath for statisticians to not mess with the data. And it breaks my heart when the first thing that people do with the data set is they throw away 99.9% .9 of the information just so that it'll fit into their model. Okay. Um, so obviously we do have some nice continuous time models around. Um, so I did my whole PhD on Gaussian processes. So I hope people don't find it too offensive if I dismiss them now. 
by saying that they're fine for low dimensional, relatively simple dynamics um, and can capture some interesting types of uh, structures such as like periodicity and trends, but it's not totally clear how we can use them to like share dynamics between patients. Um, you know, you can do this by learning like sharing prior hyperparameters or maybe some shared latent space or latent variables. So one thing I'm not gonna talk about today is the Gaussian process latent variable model developed by Neil Lawrence, which actually I think is a pretty good and sort of underrated model. And I, the only reason I'm not gonna talk about it too much is because it's, well, the model that I'll get to at the end of today is going to be actually looking a lot like the Gaussian process latent variable model, but I'll claim, I'll claim uh, better in almost every way. I mean, what I'm trying to say is I like it a lot, so much that I spend a lot of time trying to improve it a little bit. Okay. Um, the other funny thing about GPs as they stand is that they're not, so I, I find most talk about causality kind of fuzzy and confusing, but they really um, do not naturally fit this idea that we might have some sort of, you know, patient's state through time that then we want to give them an injection and that will change their state in some rapid way. It won't change anything about the past. This kind of like causal intervention is not a natural fit for Gaussian process models. Um, I will say one particular Gaussian process model um, that is I think underused is a continuous time Kalman filter. And I would say, you know, the problem is the dynamics are fundamentally linear, but you can do exact inference, exact inference is cubic. I actually don't understand why this isn't sort of like the standard first thing that people use. Um, but it's, not, it's only gonna take us so far. Okay, so any questions about this? So, okay, so again, the whole sort of next half hour at least is going to be a tutorial. And the audience is always right. If you guys sit here and, you know, if this all blows past you, it's my fault, but it's also your fault for not saying, hey, what are you talking about? Slow down. Okay. Okay, so. So the main thing I'm gonna to try to convince you of today is that latent variable models are the sort of only game in town if we want to take our models seriously. Um, so here is, oh, sorry, it's kind of awkward not to be able to point. Okay, on the right above me, rather the left. Um, okay, um, is a figure of a latent variable model, in fact, in particular, the deep Markov model. Um, and the idea is, just like in real life, we're going to say that, you know, there is some true state of the world that we don't get to observe directly. Um, I'm just gonna draw it again because it's such a great model. Um, and we have some model for how this state changes through time. Okay. And then we have some separate model for how does this latent variable tell us we should expect to see the data look like. So last time I gave a talk at the Broad, I drew some figures like this and I realized that I never distinguished between whether the arrows meant graphical model in the sense that this is a way that we can factorize the probability distribution or like computational graph, which means that this is a way that we can uh, compute, say, like x1 as a function of these other variables. So in this talk, I'm going to try to only show you graphical models that actually also correspond to computational graphs for sampling from that model. Um, so in this case, the assumption being made is just that p of um, z1 to zt, if we just look at this part, we're just, so I'll call this um, z, um, arrow, Z vector. Okay, so this is gonna be awkward. Who at the back can't see this? Okay, great. Okay, so just what this notation is showing us is that we can factorize this distribution 
Okay. And so that's the, the prior on the sort of latent dynamics. And the second thing we're just gonna say is that P of X given Z also um, factorizes. Okay, so the idea is that these are our, um, the observations and these are latent states. And I would say, you know, sometimes people call this like a POM DP if there's also maybe actions that we can take that we think affect the state. I would say life is a POM DP, right? We really do think that there is some hidden state of the world that explains things that we only get noisy observations of. Of the world? Oh, POM DP. Uh, and by that I just mean partially observable Markov decision process. Um, that's just the setting where there also happens to be some actions that let us, you know, we can choose them or observe them that also tell us how the state changes. So, anyway, I think it's worth time spending, a, like understanding this model motif because I think it's sort of the model motif. You can see, wait. No, okay, thanks for trying. It takes a village, right? Okay. Um, okay, so the main point that I want to get across today is that when you write down a latent variable model, uh, if you want to train it or make predictions, you somehow have to do inference. You somehow have to compute. So you know, all these P's implicitly have maybe some, some parameters here. So in general, any function or, or distribution I write down for this whole talk could have some parameters in there and we can make that be a mixture of Gaussians or a neural network, whatever. That's something I think is just sort of solved. Um, but if we do want to fit those parameters, then we need to compute you know, P of X given theta is um, P of X given Z, P of Z, oh, and there has to be some thetas in here. Okay, um, so we have to somehow integrate out all the Zs. Um, if we want to make predictions, like for instance, P of X T plus one given X T, um, that's just, again, an integral Right, so this is just saying, predict the latent state given the data we saw, then use that to predict the next observation and integrating over all Zs. Um, and so who here is familiar with variational inference? Okay, great. So this is gonna be maybe the last ultra tutorial part that's going to be boring for you. But for those of you who aren't familiar with this, this is gonna keep coming up over and over again, so I wanna get it totally clear. Um, so the evidence lower bound for this guy is just the expectation under some d distribution over Zs. Okay, so this is the elbow, and it's, this is a lower bound for any Q distribution. It happens to be tightest when Q of Z given X prime is close to the true posterior, P of Z prime given X prime. And now I just realized I erased um, this guy, but he also needed to know what is P of Z given X. So whether we're making predictions or training the model, we need to do this approximate inference. Okay, so that was a bit laborious, but 
the, the key point I want to make in this talk is that once I've written down this joint distribution, I can use whatever method I want to compute these integrals. And I would say I'm still doing inference in the same model. Okay. So we can use simple Monte Carlo or Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, sequential Monte Carlo, variational inference, whatever. This integral solving part is something that is like separate from defining what the model is. Okay. So when you read a paper about latent variable models, usually there's a lot of details about, for instance, up here, the recognition network. What is the structure of some neural network that's going to take in the X's, the observations, and give us some posterior over the Z's. And I'm com coming from sort of the Bayesian non-parametrics world where we were designing Markov chain Monte Carlo operators. There was all these rules that we had to follow to make sure that everything, you know, obeyed de detailed balance and gave us the right answer. Here we have total freedom to do whatever we want. All we need is that Q is something we can sample from to estimate this expectation and it defines a normalized distribution so we can evaluate this log Q term. And then you have total freedom and you can condition on everything that you've seen, condition on future information, whatever you want. It's like there's, there's no rules. Um, so I think people get intimidated when they see, for instance, here's one of the deep Markov model recognition networks. And there's reasons for this particular architecture, but any architecture would be valid. Um, it's only there to help speed up these integrals that we need to train and make predictions. Okay, so that's like sort of the central point. And I might, it might seem like I'm uh, laboring this like very simple point. However, I've come across a lot of people in the machine learning world who don't, I think, conceptually or practically make this distinction. And to them, there's just a neural network that takes in the data and makes predictions, and that's, that's machine learning. Um, and I'm gonna get into like, what's wrong with that second view in a second. But I wanna ask, are there any questions about this view of the world so far? Okay, and you know, feel free to be a stinker. Like, ask tough questions. I'm not gonna be hurt. Um, okay. So, now I'm going to build up this straw man that I think is worth tearing down, or rather, this sort of business as usual deep learning way of doing things. Yes? So that's a great question. The question is, doesn't variational inference underestimate the variance uh, systematically? And I would say yes. I mean, it's funny because you can underestimate the variance in parameters in a way that will cause you to overestimate the variance in your predictions. Like, it, it, there's no simple rules for how it breaks down. And I guess I would just say, inference is a sharp P hard problem in general. Every different family of approximations are going to have their own pros and cons. And uh, so I'm not gonna defend variational inference as being the way, the truth, and the light. It just happens to be a really simple and scalable way to do things today. We, and in fact, there's been a lot of really cool stuff going on in the last five or six years, kind of blending the best of Markov chain Monte Carlo and variational inference, for instance, from Max Welling's group. Okay, so I think you might rightfully say that, well, okay, there, you have some really weird ideological reason why you wanna separate out your, in, your generative model from your inference. But that kind of seems like you're adding in two neural networks when you only really need one. If you're interested in making predictions, why don't we just say that you know p of x1 to xt is um, All right, so rather, sorry, this is supposed to be. Uh, right, and in general, P of X T given P X less than T. So that's always something we can always do. 
Of course, it's not clear how to write a giant neural network that takes in all the old data and outputs a distribution, except using some sort of like chain that says that p of x um, t given x less than t is just some function of um, current x of t and some ht and have that ht is some update that takes in the old, uh, actually that's right, that's right. Okay, so if we can stick parameters everywhere, as I mentioned, this is just an autoregressive RNN where, um, oh man, at each step, here's the computational graph showing that we you know, take in the current xt, the old ht minus one, we get the ht, and then we use that to evaluate the likelihood of xt plus one. Something like that. Okay, so this is a totally acceptable model. Um, the downsides of doing things this way are that, or, or the upsides of doing things this way is that it's very simple and fast. I can just compute the likelihood of my model by this recursive product. Of course, we do things in log space and train by maximum likelihood. No sampling, no elbow, no inference networks. I can uh, fit the data super fast and cheap. I can also make predictions one step ahead by just calling this function, right? So that's totally taking care of for us. And now the funny things about this model is, what is this H, right? Um, so before we had this Z that represented the state of the world or the patient or the business or whatever, and then we had Q of Z, our posterior, that told us what are our beliefs about the state of the world. And of course, these are two very distinct things. But here, we're making, we're summarizing our beliefs about all, about the current state of the world in this vector that just takes all the um, previous x's and then puts them into this fixed dimensional thing. So this h is not the state of the world. It's our beliefs about the state of the world. So that's, that's like a crucial distinction that I don't think is made often enough. Um, so this is like a little bit funny because you know, in general, the posterior can have all sorts of modes, be like, you know, it can be very simple, or it can be very complex. Here we're forcing all of our beliefs about the world to you know, fit into some fixed dimensional vector. The other funny thing is that we know the optimal way to condition on data, which is to use Bayes' rule. And we use that when we're doing variational inference. But here, we have to sort of like learn to reason from scratch. We have to learn for each type of data I see, how should that combine with my existing beliefs to give me my new belief state? So. Um, so when we learn this function g from scratch, um, we're sort of throwing away the fact that we know how to do inference already. So this g thing is kind of like a mishmash of um, updating based on the data we saw and updating due to time having passed by one increment. Okay, so any questions about RNNs or autoregressive models? Okay. So, um, yeah, so I've been saying, well, I'll say one nice thing about RNNs is you could, I was saying, like, the, how can we get this to deal with continuous time? Yes? Maybe go for the uh, other model, Oh. Yes, the question is can you go from the latent variable model to the RNN by integrating out Z? And that is totally true, and that's actually a point I had been meaning to mention there, but I forgot. Thank you. Um, so a confusing point that I think hurts people for, or like stops people from realizing this distinction is that for hidden Markov models or Kalman filters, you can actually integrate out over Z exactly, and the posterior beliefs are either like um, you know a vector of state probabilities, like categorical state probabilities, or the mean invariance of a Gaussian. So in those two particular model classes, the size of the belief state never changes. It's always just a vector or a mean invariance. So these two models are actually equivalent, and you can train by either method, but you should obviously just integrate out exactly when you can. Yeah. So confusingly, for linear or like small discrete variables, you can convert them into these autoregressive models and back again. 
However, I think that that's kind of like a siren song that um, stops us from taking these, the latent variable models seriously as a totally different way of doing things. Because I don't think we'll ever be able to do anything, rather, we can't build really big, interesting models with just hidden Markov models with finite, discrete latent states, or Gaussian and linear everything. Okay. So, one model class I want to mention, though, uh, that's going to come up later is an interval aware RNN. I don't really know of a standard name for this trick, but uh, so going back to this problem of how do we deal with continuous time, we could actually let G depend directly on you know, the change in time that happened, right? I was saying that this G has to condition on this data and update our beliefs based on how much time has passed. So if it has those two things, in principle, we can do exact in, or like arbitrarily good modeling in this setting. And then I'll just say that this is a little bit funny because um, it's hard, it's not clear how to make a consistent model out of this. Like the idea being that this guy has to learn if I saw this data point and then I saw another one one second from now, rather, if I have, um, you know, or, yeah, let's make this be H. So if I had some belief state here, um, and I asked, how should my beliefs change as a function of delta t? Well, who knows? Like, you know, we'll learn this function. It depends on the, the setting. But now if I tell you, oh, actually, well, I think I might see another data point up here. So now I have to um, update to this point and then continue from there, having seen this new data point. But that's actually going to change my beliefs and then move forward. So in this model, if I like, imagine seeing a data point and then um, integrating forward over time, and then integrating over all that data that I could have seen. I, according to Bayes' rule, you should get exactly the same posterior, but it's actually pretty hard to make G obey this sort of invariance. So if I'm making extrapolations, if I you know, do rollouts one second at a time, or, one, or two seconds at a time, I'll actually have completely different um, extrapolations. So I'll just say this is like an okay sort of kludge. It's not really clear if it defines a consistent model, though. Okay, so we're gonna call this RNN delta T. Okay, any questions about this so far? Great, okay. Okay, so this, that's sort of, this is sort of the end of the tutorial part of this talk, which is that RNNs are simple and fast, and they're great if you only wanna predict a few steps ahead or evaluate the likelihood of an entire data set. But I would argue and that for like science with a capital S, if we wanna take our model seriously, Latent variable models are fiddly and slow, but they are the only model class that actually has an interpretable state, interpretable state that you can point to and that can actually mean things on its own. Um, and they can naturally handle missing data. Um, so this is kind of, well, a, a point that's gonna take a little while to explain, but um, if I have a generative model and there's an observation that I don't see, I can integrate over that observation exactly, it'll have probability one, so it doesn't actually bother us at all. Um, you can also use it to answer interesting questions, like which data, if I observed it, would most reduce my uncertainty about some other quantity at some other point in time, right? It's like a self-consistent way of answering questions about the world that you can query however you want. Okay, so this is my, that's the end of my polemic about latent variable models versus RNNs. Any questions? Cool. All right. Okay, so going back to the original point of this whole talk, what about continuous time? Um, so the obvious contender here is ordinary differential equations, which say that, okay, let's have some vector valued state indexed continuously by time, and then just specify a function that says how it changes instantaneously. Um, so this, oh, sorry, you guys can't see my mouse. So this F defines a vector field, and we can solve initial value problems by saying, what if I start at a certain point and follow this vector field? Um, the, the cool thing computationally about uh, ODEs is that we can solve them by like Euler's method, where you know just means following naively by taking small steps, or we can use fancy modern like runge kuda solvers to skip over all the, uh, like make large jumps and sort of sophisticated extrapolations, sort of adaptive computation just for um, doing inference in our model. Okay, so 
if we wanted to take some of the previous models and make them continuous time in a sort of meaningful way, one thing that you might do is have some sort of like ODE RNN where between data points, um, instead of just letting the hidden states sit there until we had a new observation, we can update them according to the dynamics of some ODE. And so I'm setting this up as like one of these R uh, RNN models where the hidden state represents our beliefs. So the idea is that if I start with these beliefs at some certain time, um, as time passes, even if I don't see any new data, I'll still change my, you know, I'm like trying to decide whether my friend is actually gonna show up or something. My beliefs about him, uh, you know, actually coming are gonna change until he does suddenly arrive and then suddenly now my beliefs are updated. And it's actually, I think, a step in the right direction in that we're separating out updating our beliefs with respect to time and updating our beliefs because we saw data. And I think these are, these should be two separate functions. Um, okay, any questions about this model? Yes. Yeah, so there's this continuity sort of, could we view it maybe another way that there is some sort of an error in the predicted trajectory after the last observation that grows and grows and eventually the next observation tells you how large that error was to begin with. Wouldn't it be possible to actually incorporate the error and not have the discontinuity in the function? Um, so the question is, are we updating based on having seen some error in our predicted trajectory? And I guess I would say, we've already moved away, or rather, I never even considered models where there's like some known true trajectory that we need to estimate. I always want to think in terms of distributions over things that we don't get to observe directly. So here H is representing, oops, HT somehow summarizes our beliefs. I'll just write it as like some transformation of the probability of the true state, which is ill-defined, um, given X up to this time. So I think it's totally fine to say that um, having seen another data point changes our beliefs about the current state um, in a discontinuous way. Like data updates our beliefs and there's nothing inconsistent about that. Yeah, right. So Oh, sorry. Um, I'm not sure actually which question. You mean Alex's question? Or? Yeah. Right, sorry, I think we have to uh, cut off the discussion. But you raise this great point, which is that there's all sorts of quantities we could be reasoning about, which is what is the probability of the state given the past data or the future data or all of the data. Um, and actually, I was just about to come to that point. Um, so here's a related paper that implemented this model and said, oh yeah, this is kind of cool. Uh, we should be updating our beliefs about these two different dimensions as we see different data. And in fact, you know, observations in one dimension of this state can tell, can, should update us about the other dimension of the state as well and reduce our uncertainty about the state given the data up to that point. Um, oh yeah. Uh, yep. Oh, the dashed line is just pointing out that on the blue dimension, this is like a multi-dimensional state, there was no observation but because we saw some other uh, data at, on the green line at the same time, we, because we have a correlated model, then you know, seeing something about the patient's weight told us about his height, basically. Okay, all right. So now I'm getting into, all the straw men are kind of getting out of the way. Um, to the model class that I really want to talk about today, which is ODE latent variable model. Um, so this is a paper that was just, it's going to appear at this upcoming uh, NeurIPS, where we, the idea is that we have this ZT0. Um, that's round to represent, it's something we're uncertain about. And so that, we can imagine that if it's like a patient, that's like, you know, his, the state of his health and genes or whatever on day one of his life. It's like a baby born. And then, the funny thing about ODEs is that they're deterministic. So we're going to say that the rest of his unknown 
health trajectory is just a deterministic function of his initial state. And of course, we can add in some interventions like, oh, we give him a shot here or, or whatever. Um, and then all the observations are going to be conditionally independent given that latent state. Okay, so this is kind of like a continuous version of that deep Markov model I was telling you about. But the funny thing is that the transitions are deterministic. So and at the bottom, you can, see, uh, you can see how to sample from this model. First, you imagine some initial state for the baby, so Z of T0 sampled from the prior. Then we can, from that initial state, run the baby's life forward as, you know, all the way as far as we want in time. And then um, at any point, we can sort of say, well, given the state, that's enough for us to tell it, say what the probability of different observations would be, like blood pressure, blood pressure or whatever. Okay. Um, and so just like the other latent variable models, we're separating out the generative model here from the inference model. Um, so as I mentioned before, the inference model has to look at all the data somehow and then come up with a posterior over Z. This is kind of a little bit awkward in this setting because we have, the only thing we're uncertain about is the, you know, their state at time zero. So if we observe their weight at like age 10, the only way to do inference in this model is to say, well, what does that tell us about what this baby's like genes were when he was a baby? Um, so what we ended up doing was running this sort of like ODE RNN backwards to just compute a distribution over the um, initial state given all the data that we've seen since then. And this will let us do inference in this model. Okay. We're putting together a lot of pieces here, so I realize this is like maybe a bit confusing. Yep. Uh, so that's great. The question is, you're not doing inference on the vector field in the ODE. So yeah, so the parameters of F are just parameters of a model that will fit by maximum likelihood. We could do inference over them. And the idea is that they would probably be shared across all patients. Like F is our model of human physiology. Yeah, no, it's just said inference. So you, but you are inferring. Yes, yes. So the whole point of this. Parametric model for the vector field. Yeah, exactly. So for the vector field, we just stick a neural network in there. And, you know, or, or it could be some model that some actual biologist knows. Yeah, and so for all these models, we train them by gradient descent. Maybe that's something that is so like natural to me that I don't even mention it anymore. But if we can compute the likelihood, we can optimize it by gradient descent to do approximate maximum likelihood. Yes? So we can. In this paper, we didn't. There was another follow-up paper called Neural Jump Stochastic Differential Equations, which basically said, oh yeah, there can be a finite number of unseen interventions, like you know, he got hit by a car or whatever, that updated the state, we didn't see it. And I think that's a natural extension of this model. But it's very, it's even more fiddly, because now you have to do some sort of like MCMC over the time and location, or sorry, time and type of these interventions. Okay, let's see, how are we doing for time? Okay. Okay, so, and to, to sort of go back to this question of, well, what does this H even represent? The nice thing is in, uh, so this is again from this other paper, contrasting that what we do inference about in the latent variable model is usually the uh, Z condition on all the data. So it's smooth in the way that you were asking for because it's saying, well, you know, if we saw all the data, we would, again, yeah, have this sort of smooth idea of what actually occurred. So. I think this is something that takes a long time to get familiar with. You kind of have to put it in your pipe and smoke it for a while. This difference between all the different ways of conditioning on data and how that gives you a different uh, quantity to reason about. So I'm not going to spend too much more time on it today. But just to highlight that whenever you, someone talks about the latent state of their model, you need to ask, is it the latent state of the world uh, about which you're going to be uncertain? Or is it representing your state of uncertainty in a vector? And these are like two totally separate ways of doing things. And when people conflate them, I feel like there's no, possible, no possibility of making progress. Okay, so, um, so I was proposing this continuous time latent variable model as like a panacea for dealing with continuous time data like the, the horrible PhysioNet data set. So here's a few results. Let's see if this works. Yeah, so this is us using gradient scent to fit one of these models on just a toy data set that you can see is irregularly sampled, and it fits pretty well. Um, the, in the bottom middle, that's the F, that's the vector field 
that has a neural network just specifying what the dynamics are. Um, so B, top row is posterior samples on, you know, conditioning on certain data sets, or data points, sorry, data sets after we fit the same dynamics for all of these uh, data sets. And on the left bottom, you can see these are like the latent dimensions. The latent dimension doesn't have to be the same as the observed dimension. In fact, it should always be different. And then in data space on the bottom right, you can see these are like samples from the prior. If I don't condition on any data, I can just say, what would an average you know, human physiology sort of sequence look like? This is kind of what I meant about being able to ask different questions about your model once you've trained it. Okay, so I, I was sort of harping on about this point that the belief states, these H's, uh, are not nearly as meaningful as the Z's, the state of the world. And so here's a very simple demo where we fit data from the Mujoku sort of physics simulator of these like little legged creatures that are sort of tumbling around and falling. And so the data is just like what all the joint positions are. It's like 20 dimensional. It's a pretty easy problem and it is actually also deterministic, right? Like in a rigid body physics simulation with no perturbations, it exactly fits our latent ODE model. That there's some hidden state of the world that we don't get to observe. Well, without, we added noise to the observations to make it a little bit harder. Um, so if we look at, so this, these frames are a little movie of a little guy, he's like suspended in the air and then he falls and he hits the ground and bounces. It's kind of hard to see, but the point is that at the point where he bounces, the norm of the change of um, Z also bumps up, right? So remember F tells us how is Z changing through time? The norm of F tells us how much is the state changing through time? So this is great. The latent state tells us, hey, something happened right there. Uh, this guy, his dynamics changed a lot. Whereas if you look at the change in the hidden state of an RNN, it's kind of like just, you know, looking at the total sum of all like electrical spikes in someone's brain and trying to figure out, you know, what's going on in their world. It's just not a very direct measure of what's going on. And in fact, if they're computing in some sense efficiently, it shouldn't be, right? Um, so the point is we just see random spikes all the time in the uh, H representation. Okay, um, and I'm not gonna spend too much on, time on this, but you know, we, because this model happens to exactly fit the problem we're trying to solve, it is the best at predicting the uh, future. Um, another sanity check is here we can ask, okay, how much does our uncertainty about the initial state change as we see more data points? Right, this is like a basic sanity check, but more information should make us more certain. And because we're keeping track of our uncertainty separately from our belief, or like the state, the state we, can, we can ask, well, how much uh, is your entropy reduced when you see more data? And it shrinks, right? So this is, you might say, well, obviously that's gonna happen, but again, it's only going to happen because we separated out these concerns. Um, and then finally, this is us just trying to say, uh, even though we use neural networks for everything in this model, they didn't know anything about the true dynamics or like physics, it's still when we look at the states, they represent, they correspond pretty closely to actual different quantities in the real simulation that humans might think was meaningful. So you don't always have to like, obviously if you have domain knowledge, you should probably put that in your dynamics function, but even if you don't, you can sometimes look at the state and realize, oh, it learned that like this dimension is blood pressure or whatever, maybe. So. You know, I say maybe because now we applied it to the PhysioNet data, which is not actually deterministic, right? And it's real world data, it's very messy. Um, and we can see that in the, we, well, we compare the ODE RNN, which I th say is this hacky thing that we have to include as like a baseline. Um, it does pretty well. RNN delta T on the left there, actually, it's, it's about the worst, but it's, it was pretty simple to train, right? Like, I would always recommend doing this like RNN delta T thing as a baseline. Um, and then of course, the latent ODE thing did the best. One thing that kind of made me sad is what didn't help is the latent ODE plus, plus Poisson likelihoods. So I'm just gonna talk very briefly. This is one of my favorite things that didn't quite pan out, which is that we can actually condition on the times at which observations happen. Right, like if I have a medical data set, um, and you know, the patient comes in as a baby a bunch, and then I don't see them for 10 years, and they start coming in again. Well, if I was a doctor, I might say, if he didn't have a scheduled shot or whatever, 
I already think something's probably wrong with this person because they came to the hospital. So um, when you, without binning data, you can't actually evaluate any sort of continuous time likelihood unless you can solve continuous time integrals, which show up in the Poisson process likelihood there. But because we can differentiate through ODE, ODE solutions, we can actually evaluate Poisson process likelihoods and condition on the times as well. And here on the right-hand side, we can see the green line is what the inferred rate is for these different observations on a particular patient. And they actually, it kind of makes sense, right? Uh, these are a little bit cherry-picked, but the, when there's lots of observations, we also learned that there's like, you know, a high probability of there being observations. So we actually get to see if the model understands, given what this patient's doing, we expect them to have had their blood pressure, measure, uh, blood pressure measured or something like that. Okay. Still okay on time. So the main problem with this uh, model is that the, 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 the deterministics are, di uh, sorry, the dynamics are deterministic, which is a really weird assumption to make. Um, I mean, that might be true for Newtonian physics if you really have a state that's large enough to model like the entire state of the universe, but in general, we can't put everything into our state, so we have to allow for there to be some sort of like random unobserved interventions. Um, some other funny things is that, as I said, the inference requires you to look at data from the end of the guy's life and reason about what he was like as a baby. It's like kind of, and then use that to then predict everything forward again. It's kind of circuitous. We have a special time zero, which is weird. Um, it's kind of slow. So the stuff that I've been doing lately that I'm super excited about, but I didn't want to spend the whole time talking about because it's not ready for prime time yet. And uh, I think having been through this hype cycle, I really didn't want to come in here and say, hey, here's my cool net model that doesn't work yet. Um, see you in two years or whatever. But here's my cool model that doesn't quite work yet, which is we talked about the deep Markov model and how in the transitions, um, you know, when I write z of t plus one, um, sorry, z of t goes to z, z of t plus one like this, if these are both circles, that means that actually there's the possibility for noise to be added, or like, you know, this is only uh, determining the distribution over z of t plus one. So, and as I mentioned also, although I didn't explain all that well, if there happens to be some data that we just never observed, um, we can just leave it out of the model and it doesn't actually change any of our predictions. So we could imagine saying, take a deep Markov model and make the updates being like really, really uh, fine. You know, instead of every hour, let's just add a transition every second or every millisecond. We can, actually, we can imagine taking the infinitesimal limit of like constantly updating our state a little bit and adding a small amount of noise. Uh, we end up with an SDE. And I know I'm almost out of time. So just to not be mysterious, in the ODE we had uh, oh shoot, yeah. Okay, f of z of t. Um, just to make the notation easier later, we can bring the t up here. We can say, you know, change in z depends on change in t this way. Uh, and ODE just says, oh yeah, and then let's have some some sort of noise scaling that, that multiplies by this thing, which it, I don't have time to get into, I'm sorry. It's just a little bit of random Gaussian noise. So it's basically saying at every step we add a little bit of uh, random Gaussian noise. And this is a natural fit for like a lot of systems where there's maybe millions of tiny interactions um, that we don't get to observe directly. So like, you know, motion, molecules hitting each other in a, um, gas or like, you know, mating in a gene pool or prices in a market due to trades. Basically, the actual inter interactions don't have to be Gaussian. Like the noise doesn't have to be Gaussian. The if the central limit theorem kicks in, then you will end up with Gaussian noise as you take the limit of more and more smaller, smaller interactions. So it's a pretty wide class of mod models, even though it has this like Gaussian noise thing. Um, and I had actually planned to spend some time doing some math on the board to say, how do you do inference in this model? But the basic punchline is you have one ODE, or sorry, one SDE to say what the prior is, and another SDE to say what the approximate posterior is. Um, and it all works out really nicely. 
And it's sort of like a continuous time version of the deep Markov model, which, as I've been saying, is a great model, except it can't handle continuous time very naturally. Um, so, um, so the idea is that we're going to, just like the latent ODE model, have this you know, multivariate time index thing that we do Bayesian inference in. Um, the like, sort of technical innovation that was stopping people from fitting these models before was how to train them. And I'm going to talk about this more on Thursday, actually, at MIT. But basically, the whole question is, like, how do you run sort of this stochastic process backwards? It turns out to be, like, I didn't think it was going to be a problem. And then there was a bunch of measure theory that came up. And then it turned out it wasn't a problem. Um, the other technical issue is, how do you store the all the randomness that you use on the forward pass uh, to, again, reuse it on the reverse pass? And it turns out that you can kind of use this tree structure to reconstruct it as finely as you need. Um, and you end up with like a pretty good time complexity compared to if you just ran the whole, uh, if, if you did the sort of naive backprop that we would normally do through like a deep Markov model. Um, okay, and then just last night at like 11, we got this to work. Uh, oh. oh yeah, so you can see it, but I can't. Okay, so this is just a toy 1D thing. We have irregularly sampled data. We have, I think it was an OU, like an olstein ullmann process prior, but Laplace likelihoods, right? We can use whatever likelihood we want. It doesn't change the inference. We can use as many latent dimensions as we want. It doesn't change the inference. And we end up with this non-Gaussian posterior being fit automatically. And here's another example with sort of a big gap in the middle. And what you're watching is the parameters of the posterior being fit, the posterior SCE being fit um, by maximizing this sort of infinitesimal elbow, and ta-da, it works. Right? So now we have another alternative to GPs for fitting irregularly sampled time series data, but which have this like, sort of causal like, arrow of time construction. So we can actually put like, a right Fisher model in there and fit it by, from gradients. And then to show that this doesn't just work on 1D data, we also fit it on some mocap data. Um, and I was trying to make these videos last night, and my students said, oh, all the code for this is in MATLAB. And like, he never even used MATLAB. Um, right, okay. Uh, but we, the point is we were able to fit 11,000 parameters in this SDE model because we're using gradients. There's a whole bunch of work on fitting SDEs for the last like 50 years that basically just don't scale. So this is, now we have scalable gradients for SDEs. Um, let's see, I'm pretty much out of time. I'll just say, you know, this obviously only barely works. Um, SDE solvers are also just much crappier than ODE solvers. I think fundamentally they're just going to be a slower thing. Um, none of this is like friendly for the GPU yet, and we have to use diagonal noise. For those of you who are SDE aficionados, everything worked out really nicely so that you can have Milstein solvers with for everything that you need to do this training. But if you use non-diagonal noise, you have to compute Levy areas. Um, and this model doesn't have like this jump-style noise that I was talking about, where like the patient gets hit by a car. It's not really clear that that's a good fit for this thing. We could always add it in; it would make things more complicated. Um, all right, that's it. Okay, so takeaways are latent variable models are sort of more accessible, extensible, interpretable. I would say the only real choice for like hard science with an S, um, but you have to separate out the generative and inference tasks. Um, and you should always ask when you're reading a paper and someone talks about latent state, is it a belief state or an actual state in the model? And I would say continuous time is still awkward, but becoming less so. Um, and what we're hoping to do now is basically scale up this model, this SDE model, to work on actual problems, which involves like, a lot of like, fun with adaptive solvers. Um, anyone who has expertise in this, we would love your help to build like, a usable code base that would be accessible to people who aren't willing to like, actually you know, fiddle with the details. OK, thank you very much. And yeah, but before we move on, I want to point out a lot of this work was done by Joy Chen Li, who just finished his undergrad. He's a Google resident. He's going to be applying for grad school this year. This guy is so amazing. Actually, Leonard Wong, who's a prof that worked with me on this stuff, said it's like working with a postdoc. He just finished his undergrad. Okay. Um, uh, so I think I'm a little over time. So maybe should we say like those who have to go go, and who wants to ask questions should stay. Okay.